Coming up on Techzilla, 802.11 and is ready. We get the lowdown on this year's Intel Developers Forum from an Antex and on Shimpy. Lloyd Case joins us with a smoke and $800 gaming machine. And we've got the HTC Hero, Logitech Super Mouse, and help stopping the party printer in your dorm. Draw yourself a triple espresso and pile on the sugar, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by DimDim, easy free web conferencing, Squarespace, and GoDaddy.com. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Ryan Block. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or advice on the best place to buy Black Sox in Orange County, California, we've got an answer. And if we don't, we'll track down somebody who does. Ryan Block, sir, welcome. Thanks for having me. You're in for Veronica, who's on special assignment. Yes. We're not sure she's who she's on special assignment for. That'll be known soon enough. I like that thought. It's all secret, so you'll have to watch the internets to find out. So, you're the co-founder of a gadget-obsessed website, gdgt.com. You can say that. Do you have a shiny, happy gadget with us? I've got a few. Where's yeah. the, do you want to show us the, the phone? Yeah, let's do it. So. If you haven't seen it, ladies and gentlemen, the HTC Hero. This is actually coming out real soon in the U.S. on Sprint. Uh, it actually looks a little bit different on Sprint, though. It's got a completely different face, and it doesn't have this big, I call it the Jay Leno chin downstairs. What's up with the Jay Leno chin? It's a design feature. It's something HTC just decided, you know, they were going to put this in their phones. The G1 on T-Mobile has one as well. Uh, this one does not have a keyboard inside like the G1, but mm -hmm. it is a little bit thinner. It's kind of more iPhone sized. The interface on the HTC Hero is gorgeous. Are they going to sort of just ruin it when they, they sprintify it? No, actually I think they're going to keep it the same. It runs something called HTC Sense and this mm -hmm. is actually a custom interface that was done by HTC. So this kind of uh, scrolling navigation widget interface that you've got on the front, that's, that's actually mostly HTC stuff. And they actually built in some really cool stuff in it. Like you can do Twitter directly from the home screen. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, HTC is usually kind of, we always think of them as being sort of arm in arm with Windows Mobile. Are they, is this really their own operating system? No, this is Android. I mean, this is stock oh. Android, and, and you can download any Android app and it'll work on, on the device. Uh, but they built stuff on top of it to make it even easier to use, even sexier. Uh, so it's not just your you know, generic vanilla Android install. They pretty much had me at the sort of opening with the, the vintage alarm clock flip number display. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that, <laughs> that's definitely one of my favorite effects. But yeah, I mean, being able to do Twitter from the from the home screen. You've got a mail app on the home screen. I think one of the coolest things about it is unlike the iPhone, which is just a bunch of apps, this thing actually has the apps themselves embedded as widgets into the home screen panels. I like that thought. How's the web browsing on it? I mean, it's not as good as the iPhone, to be honest, <laughs> but it's pretty good. I mean, it's better than what you're going to get on a Razor. So are you going to dump your iPhone and, and, and move to Sprint? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, come on. It's the iPhone. It's on AT&T. It's not that great in terms of service. Right. It makes up for it in the apps and in the browser and I all gotta that say that the move to 850 megahertz in San Francisco is the it literally pulled me from buying out the contract of my phone and my wife's phone and moving us to another carrier. Yeah, I mean it's it's been getting better for some, but not for everybody, and that's part of the problem. Is there's just not enough spectrum to go around right now. Mm -hmm. So one of the things AT&T has actually been doing is they have these devices called femtocells. All of the carriers have them now, and they're basically a micro cell tower that you put inside of your house. You hook it up to the internet. And then you actually have to pay them more money to get service in your home in case you don't have it. It's kind of a racket. It's kind of a vicious racket. I'm not even going to go there because I'll just say mean and nasty things. Yeah, just, we could we could probably talk about that for a while. Well, and I, I can actually the phone works in most of my house now. If I go down to the garage and stand in front of the house, the phone doesn't work anymore. But now I can actually dial 911 like from inside my house. So I'm very excited about. Well, that. yeah, that's a good thing. I mean, being able to call <laughs> emergency services when necessary always being able a plus. to receive calls when I'm at home. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So what's new at GDGT? You guys have uh, some homepage tweaks. Yeah, so we actually just rolled out a new feature that allows you to import and find your friends and invite your friends from Gmail, Facebook, and Twitter. We're going to do some more Facebook and Twitter stuff in the near future. But I think actually one of the coolest things we've done in the last couple of weeks is we have a new version of our homepage where you can actually customize 
items, all of the, the feed items that appear in it. So updates from your friends, recent discussions, new reviews, anything that has to do with a product that you, uh, that you own or want or any of your friends on the site can come into you through this customized feed. Oh, I like that thought. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So uh, am I going to have that same experience like I had with Facebook where it searches through my Gmail address book and I like, realize that like, every ex-girlfriend <laughs> I've had from seven years well, 10 years ago since I've been married for a long time, is going to show up in that list? <laughs> uh, no, well, I mean, it's all opt-in, right? It, it, okay. You don't just automatically become their friend. Oh, yeah, you, you, you get to go and choose who you want to you know, be friends with and all I'm that just stuff. Checking. No obligation. I like that thought. Yeah, we're not going to spam anybody either. That stuff drives me crazy. I, I can imagine. Plus, it would drive your users crazy, and they would drive you completely insane. Yeah, well, look, I, you know... I, you, you tend to go with what you know drives you crazy and avoid that, and that's usually a pretty good barometer. Ready to talk 802.11n? Let's do it. All right. We regularly get questions about 802.11n, which router to buy, how to configure it. Is 802.11n actually done? That would be the number one question. As of September 11th, 2009, 802.11n is finished. That only took, what, seven years? <laughs> you were watching your clock, weren't you? Yes. Get very careful. <laughs> a lot of people were. I mean, it, it took forever, uh, but it's also kind of the, the last and final major release of Wi-Fi that mm -hmm. we're going to see for quite a while. Should take us out for at least a number of uh, a number of years again. Especially since it's kind of you know it, it's interesting because draft 2.0 ADA 2.11 and products um, are basically all officially. 802.11n, they don't need to go through a recertification process. What is kind of interesting is there's some features were enabled in the final version that were not enabled in the draft version, like a, I want to say a four streaming channel version, which means the, the, the maximum capacity will be up to 600 megabits per second if you're in five gigahertz, um, 40 hertz mode, you know what I mean? Like the, For most people, it's not going to matter, though. Yeah. And depending on your hardware, you might be able to get a firmware update that brings you all the way up to date, gives you all of those features. Right. But I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be looking for a couple of things. You're going to be looking for uh, simultaneous dual band, and that's not something that is 802.11n spec. That's something that your router has to officially support itself. I got a dual band router. I oh, like it. We'll, fantastic. we'll talk about that later. <laughs> and, uh, and you also got to be looking for uh, something with a good amount of range. I think you're going to run into range issues. Mm -hmm. And you know coverage of your whole home, problems with that far you know far before you actually hit bandwidth cap uh, when you're talking 600 megs or. In, in, to put this into context, my gigantic San Francisco home, which is 700 square feet, um, <laughs> by merely taking the 802.11 and, and putting it on like four feet below the, 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 the bottom of the, the living space in my, my house, it makes it enormously difficult to use in the far corners of the house. And this is not, we're not talking about, this isn't this you know, 6,000 square foot mega mansion. This isn't a typical 2,000 square foot American home. It's it's interesting that Ethernet, like the faster wireless gets, the more valuable my, my gigabit Ethernet. Uh, yeah, so, you <laughs> know, I, I, st I still use Ethernet all the time. It's mm -hmm. it's it's there. It's reliable. It's always fast. It's it's a known quantity. It's secure. And yeah, no matter how many times they break WEP or WAP or WAP2 or whatever, <laughs> you know your Ethernet is going to be secure. And we also live in areas where the population is incredibly dense. So there's probably, I think there's 30. 802211 that works on one type or another, you know, that I can get from the least accessible portion of my house. And I've, I've never actually figured out, like, if I go to the street where it's open with a decent antenna, I think I get 107 networks. Yeah, so range, interference, all these things are not something you really have to worry about when you're doing wire. But that said, you know, not everybody's going to do a wire network in their house. It, it, it's a pain to right. actually get that done. So. 802.11n is is uh, really useful and it's yeah. it's a capable technology and uh, if you've bought in the last couple of years there's a high likelihood that what you're using is going to be as good as the new hardware coming out. Yeah, if it works, don't fix it. If you're curious about how fast your existing equipment is compared to the latest stuff, check out the benchmarks at smallnetbuilder.com. They do a phenomenal job benchmarking these. You've got a router that I haven't seen yet, Fonera Phone, and it's not the original. Talk about Fonera and what their business model is. It's kind of tricky. It's kind of like subscription Skype over Wi-Fi, and they want to basically blanket the world in Fonera Wi-Fi. And right. basically what that means is if you see one of these access points when you're running around, you can connect to that Wi-Fi, and you can make phone calls on it, and you can browse the web if you share your Wi-Fi with one of these devices. If you don't, you have to pay a little bit of money. And you can actually earn some money by doing that, by sharing your internet connection. It's, have you, it's have kind you of tricky. met anybody who's actually earned any money from them yet? It's not very big in the U.S., right. for starters. And I think you know, you've either heard of it or, or you haven't. If you haven't, that's because it's not very big in the U.S. And mm -hmm. if you have, 
you probably already know it's not very big in the U.S. But outside the U.S., <laughs> it's actually got a little bit of a pickup. Is it an expensive router to buy? Well, you know, it's it's not incredibly expensive, and part of that is, I think, because they want to try to subsidize it because they make money from you actually using it and getting people to connect to that Wi-Fi hotspot and transfer data. Um, but, you know, it does do some stuff that, uh, that other routers don't. Such as? Well, it's got this USB port right here, and some routers have that, some don't. This one actually, you can connect a USB hub to this and connect a whole plethora of devices. You got USB uh, 3G modem, you can plug into that thing, a uh, printer, uh, you can do a network drive, uh, just plug in any USB hard drive and that, that can be shared over the network. So you get your storage, your, your print management, you can do 3G if you're off the... <laughs> I guess you're away from the internets, the normal internets. Well, yeah, and so one of the other things it does is uh, it's got a YouTube and Flickr uploader, too. So you can oh, nice. actually just throw a bunch of media at it, walk away from your computer, and it'll get uploaded to the cloud. So it's pretty much has everything but a BitTorrent client. Uh, no, it has that, too. Oh, really? Yes. And actually, one of the cool things is it has apps. So there's, a, there's an app store for your router where you can get plugins and applications so it can run other clients as well. Uh, I mean, clearly, people still have to go out and develop that stuff. Uh, but it can run on there. So it sounds like it's got a lot of the features of like a Windows Media Server or a Drobo Share or... Yeah, a little bit, except it's, it's your router, which is a good place to have it. You know, you don't want these things on the edge of your network. You want them in the middle of your network. Mm -hmm. It's really valuable there. So the fact that this can kind of run all that stuff from the center instead of on, on the edge of your, your internal cloud. So how much does it cost? Uh, $99. It's actually pretty good for an 802.11n router, especially one that does all the stuff. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be dual band for 99 bucks. No, it's not going to be dual band, but I mean, they would like you to know, mm -hmm. uh, phone would like you to know, that you can actually make money with it. I don't know that you will make any money with it, <laughs> but, but you can. Technically, you could. There so is a, that. There is a business model in place. Yeah, well, okay. if, uh, if, if you choose to buy it, if not, you can still just use it as a router. It's a nice theory. If enough people buy them, some of them will make money. Hopefully. I like that. One thought. can only hope. I went with a more traditional 802.11 router in my house. I actually got uh, one of the new Linksys routers, uh, dual band router, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. My neighborhood has dozens, something like 150,000 networks running on 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, B, G, and N, the B ones I especially love to make fun of, especially the ones that are open, as in unsecured with admin admin on the uh, routers. We won't get into that. Anyhow, dual band equals compatibility with older gear in the house fairly empty bandwidth for our newest, fastest hardware because we can run the 802.11n at 5 gigahertz. Now, up until a couple weeks ago, my Linksys WRT610N simultaneous dual N-band wireless router was the best deal out there on a dual band until the Netgear WN DR3700, doesn't that just roll off the tongue, Range Max dual band wireless N gigabit router, continuing to roll off the tongue, came out. Spotlightbuilder.com's benchmark showed that the Netgear has much better throughput than the Linksys, at least in weak signal locations. So if you're looking for, basically, if you've got a bigger house, that's the way to go. They test throughput, it's really interesting, they test throughput across a half dozen rooms, and uh, it was really disheartening to see that you know, in their test situation, uh, my router is getting spanked by the, the <laughs> Those slightly guys do newer. a really good job, though. You know, very, yeah. very thorough. It's amazing because nobody else is testing uh, network hardware anymore. So if you are shopping for network hardware, it's definitely worth heading over there. Um, you know, I grok the physics that 5 gigahertz performance is going to be weaker than 2.4 gigahertz, right? The, 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 sh the shorter the wavelength, the, the, the worse it, it is at covering through distance or going through walls. But it was phenomenal how poor 5 gigahertz works, even in my poorly built small wooden house. Um, I'm actually moving the router from the garage to the main floor and to the center of the house to try to make up for the fact that a thin layer of sheetrock and some uh, So here's, here's a little tip pretty much from me to it. you. Okay. Uh, get tomato or DDWRT and then just crank up the amperage. <laughs> just, just go all the way outside of FCC rules, just nail it. Receiver sensitivity is actually much more valuable <laughs> than cranking up the amperage. This is true. Uh, and, a, and a receiver sensitivity. Did I mention Ethernet's a really good solution? I like the Ethernet. Well, it was amazing. What's, what's, unfortunately, there's no open firmware that allows you to abuse uh, the, the new 802.11n stuff yet, but it was, uh, I'm just going to move it to the middle of the house and then start from there. Can I, I, can I just throw one other thing out there? Why do these all come with four ports? I mean, does nobody use more than four Ethernet ports? I use like 20. Because that way they can sell you more hubs. That's or these actually they're all switches now. Somebody's got to make one like an eight port or a ten port. I you know I keep thinking it's going to happen, and then I keep basically. What's really funny is trying to find something larger than a five hub switch at the local computer store. Because apparently nine. Uh, ports in a switch is all you're ever going to need if you count the five 
four? Four that are already in your router. I don't know. If somebody's out there working in the industry has an answer for us, let us know. Because actually, we're both curious now. Why? Why not more ports? Maybe the average home only uses like three ports. Yeah, well, my home uses more, so there's an unmet demand for you. I'll buy some more gear. Stella Gum, people, the ultimate travel mouse, and Anand Shippy from Anantech.com gives us his scoop from the Intel Developer Forum. But while we've got your attention, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Dim Dim. Dim Dim is easy, free web conferencing. It's super easy to use, built on open source, and 100% browser based. It's so easy, just start a meeting and IM or email your Dim Dim URL. Your friends or clients click that link, and in seconds, they are in the same web conference room with you, sharing your computer screen documents, whiteboards, even seeing and hearing you via your webcam. You can host, attend, even record your events with no download required. Just a browser, people. Best of all, Dim Dim is free. That's right, people, it is free. Get over to dimdim.com slash techzilla to sign up for Dim Dim for free to support our show and to join the more than 3 million people who love Dim Dim. It takes less than 15 seconds to sign up, and it's free. And as an added bonus, if you sign up, you can join the Techzilla crew here on the set through Dim Dim. We're hosting a Dim Dim meeting, and we'll take some of your questions on the show as we tape Techzilla on Monday, October 12th. That's right, you'll get a chance to have your questions selected for use on Techzilla. Just sign up at dimdim.com slash techzilla and you'll automatically receive an email invite to join us on October 12th. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick. A free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week's pick, Net Newswire for the iPhone. This latest update of the app from NewsGator, the people that make Feed Demon for Windows and Net Newswire for the Mac, syncs directly to your Google Reader account via the Google Reader API. The new iPhone version 2.0 is free with ads, or you can pay $1.99 to have it ad free. The 2.0 version is fast, pretty easy to use, and actually grabs and caches the content from your feed so you can read it offline and you don't have a connection, which is most of the time if you're an iPhone owner in the US on AT&T. You can also send links to Instapaper or Twitter. Now, some users have complained about the transition from NewsGator's online services and the slowness in the new version of the app, but it's actually been pretty good for me so far. Of course, if you feel like spending a couple of bucks and looking for some similar options, check out Byline, Gazette, or Newsstand. But if you're looking for a simple free solution that uses Google Reader's API, check out NetNewsWire 2.0. Anybody that travels with a laser mouse or works the Wi-Fi from a local cafe has run into the heartbreak of your mouse failing. At least your laser mouse when it comes into glass. Now Logitech claims their dark field laser tracking technology can work anywhere. You're you're excited about this. The dark field. dark field. Dark yeah. Actually, so, I, don't, I don't know what that means. I really I mean it's it's a it's a thing. They're calling it dark field. It tracks on clear surfaces. So you're you can track it on a mirror. It's that's kind of crazy. crazy. Yeah, it's kind of creepy actually. Because I mean, it has made, you can, for most laser mice, they'll go through dust, they'll go through cat fur, they'll work on your jeans, yeah, they'll work on the... Basically, the way that it works is it actually looks for irregularities and imperfections on the surface. Uh, and that's what it uses as a map to know where it's at. Mm -hmm. So the higher resolution, the more irregularities it can pick up, and supposedly the more accurate it's going to be. This one is apparently so accurate, how it can pick up irregularities at such a minute level that you can track it on a piece of glass. So we actually, we have a piece of plexiglass here, completely clear, no tricks, <laughs> and, uh, and it will track on this. So I can actually mouse around on it. Presuming it, uh, it works, I can't actually see it right now. So uh, how's the wireless performance on this been? Well, it's pretty good. I mean, it's a portable mouse, and Is they actually Bluetooth have a desktop mouse, version. But I mean, how often are you mousing far away from your computer, right? I mean, it needs to be good within like five feet and you'll probably be fine. I gotta be honest with you, I've, I've, I've had a, a Bluetooth mouse with fresh batteries lose its connection in like three days over and over again, so. Yeah, so one of the cool things about this guy is uh, you pop it open, you can use one or two batteries. So I can take one of these out if it's, say, you know, one of these is freshly charged and the mm -hmm. other one isn't, and it will still run on the other. Oh, nice. Yeah, so, and it's also good for when you're going on, uh, on a trip and maybe you want something that is a little bit lighter you, you can have one that you know doesn't have the full weight of two full AA batteries in it. Or, or you can pretend you're like super gamer and adjust the throw weight of your mouse <laughs> by taking a battery It is mouse. actually, it's pretty heavy with two AA's mm -hmm. in it. I kind of wish it would have been AAA's or rechargeable. Uh, but it's nice that you can do it on, 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 the single, uh, on the single battery. The other cool thing it has is this uh, free scrolling wheel, which is what some of the other versions of this mouse have, the, uh, the, the VX Nano. Oh, and nice. basically if you, I don't know if you can see that, but if you spin it like that, it will just scroll until it runs out of inertia. And when you click it down, it does the ratcheting click. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's like really nice if you want to get through a really large document quickly. OK, it comes with a dongle. Does this mean it is or is not Bluetooth? Unfortunately, it is not Bluetooth. <sighs> it does use the Logitech unifying receiver, though. So that is actually their new receiver technology that 
any Logitech product you buy now can all use the same dongle. You don't mm -hmm. have to have multiple dongles for multiple products, and they all use the same standard. Uh, but it's not Bluetooth. So yeah, you have to have that thing. So $80, does it go in your bag? Does it travel with you everywhere? It has traveled with me everywhere since I've gotten it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, $80 is a lot of money for a travel mouse. I really like it, though. Knowing that I can mouse anywhere, I never have to deal with another glass surface again. You can that's travel awesome. around with a legal pad just so you can yeah. mouse. Or, yeah, or trying to find a magazine that isn't glossy as though those exist. I or mean, buying a newspaper so you can mouse. Yeah, and then getting the newspaper <laughs> ink all over your hand. No, no, no it's, it's, it's worth it just for that. I like the thought. Strong, strong words, people. All right, last week, Intel held the annual Intel Developer Forum. We had a chance to talk with Nantech.com founder and CEO Anand Shimpy about what Intel has coming up for your Macs and PCs. Anand, welcome to Techzilla. Thank you. You've been doing this for a while now. Yeah, 12 years. That's exciting. Yeah. Is it still fun? Yes, more fun now. Really? What's yeah. that? Well, so initially it was fun because I didn't know anything, and it was all like really cool and new. Um, now it's fun because uh, the technology is a lot more mature, and I get to talk about really, really cool things now. That's actually pretty exciting. And some exciting stuff happened this week. Intel Developer Forum, a.k.a. IDF, a.k.a. Intel's chance to influence everybody that makes PCs for a living and all other forms of technology, because that's what Intel wants to do in their lifelong battle with Microsoft and now Google. <laughs> so any big anything exciting in IDF this year? Um, uh, there was a lot of stuff that was exciting around IDF, yeah. uh, right? So at the beginning of this month, we talked about Linfield, mm -hmm. um, which you guys also talked about, which is Core i5 and right. an affordable Core i7. Um, at IDF, we kind of have the, the next step uh, beyond Linfield. So Linfield was four cores, mm -hmm. and now we bring Nehalem down to two cores. Oh, um, and that comes in two flavors, Arendale and Clarkdale. Um, the E3300. <laughs> kind of. So uh, uh, Arendale is, is mobile dual core Nehalem. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've always referred to it as this is going to be what you want in your next MacBook. <laughs> um, and you can look out for those in, in the beginning of next year. Um, and then Clarkdale is the desktop equivalent. So if you're one of those guys that bought Conroe and, and those really awesome dual core processors that Intel made back in 06, this is the upgrade you want. What are we talking about in terms of, of performance versus the, the core two duos? Uh, significant performance improvement, right? So you get the, the same kind of architecture as Nehalem, um, but just with two cores. So you have much, much lower power consumption. Uh, I was measuring under 30 watts for a oh, full wow. system at idle. And, and under full load, you're looking at 70. Um, the other cool thing is, uh, this is the first on package graphics. So mm -hmm. on your CPU chip, you've got your processor core and your graphics core. Will they be any better than the sort of off, pro uh, or sorry, I should say, they, the, the bundled graphics from Intel have been kind of miserable for the last yes. couple of so years. Yes, so. Is this miserable one, but taking up less space in the motherboard? It, it's, it's, this one is actually an improvement. <laughs> really? Um, I haven't tested it. I, I have, you know, some preliminary data. True. But their whole deal is, since it's on the CPU package, uh, it's got to be at least reasonable. Right. Um, the other thing you get with it is you get full a channel LPCM, bit streaming, Dolby 2 HD, oh, nice. and DTS HD Master. So it's not just a magnificent mobile processor, it could be the heart of your next home theater PC. Oh, perfect for HD PC, um, if they can get the software working. The, so when you say if they can get the software working, which software are you referring to? Uh, all of them. So I, I've seen it working <laughs> with, uh, with uh, um, uh, some of the packages mm -hmm. out there. Um, they're, they're working with all the vendors, so you'll see stuff from Cyberlink. Um, so you're talking about Blu-ray playback. Exactly. Is HTCP an issue when, you put it, when you're working with it on the, on the die like that, or where does it actually become a, a problem with getting it to run? Um, HTCP is always a problem. It's just right. a pain, right? <laughs> like it's it's uh, the 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 hoops they make you jump through right. to get Blu-ray working on your PC are just because they effectively make you handshake and lock down every single part of the data path right out to the monitor on the HDMI or DVI, which is a non-trivial technical problem to solve. Well, it's interesting. At least if you so want audio and video in you, sync, <laughs> you you basically have to encrypt and decrypt every step of the way. So when the CPU touches the data, it has to decrypt it, decrypt it, look at it, encrypt it, send it to the graphics mm -hmm. processor. That has to uh, decrypt it, decode it, encrypt it, send it out to uh, HDMI to your monitor. And yeah. <laughs> it, it's just a pain. And you have to do that both for video and audio. So it is a complicated system. Um, but it, you know, hopefully we're a couple of months away from launch. And, and they're taking it seriously now. And I'm, I'm helping them test. So That's a good thing. <laughs> you still be beating it with a very finely tuned stick. Yeah. Do you see this as being sort of a gateway for more home theater PCs? Do you see it as becoming integrated? I mean, because it, it's kind of amazing watching a lot of the stuff. It, it's like everybody and their mother uses the Sigma chipsets in some type of box, does amazing 1080p playback. The interface goes from amazing to 
miserable depending on how much work they put into it. Is this Intel kind of trying to weasel into that market, or is it just something that's decided, well, we can put everything in a notebook, why don't we go ahead and do that? Well, this is Intel was actually a pioneer in, in this feature, right? They were the first to include eight channel PCM output over HDMI. Sure. Um, it's totally a, like a rich guy home theater thing, mm -hmm. so I, I don't know why they keep doing it, but I'm, I'm glad they are. Um, <laughs> ultimately, it, it is cool, and, and I, I don't know what kind of uh, usage models it enables, because mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those things where I can tell you the technology is good, right. uh, and then some smart guy is going to use it for something. Because right. um, the beauty of, of being able to bitstream this stuff is you can get uh, a, a bit for bit copy of the soundtrack that was mastered in the movie studio mm -hmm. out to your speakers, right? You're not losing right. any, there's no compression. You, I mean, it's, it's, there is compression, but it's not lossy. Um, and that's just cool. And it, with something that's that cool, you got to be able to do something with it, right? <laughs> you would hope. <laughs> but right now, it's, it's perfect for if you're, you know, the, the high-end home theater market is, mm -hmm. is loving it. Do you see that, is that going to be integrated in like mini IT, ITX boards, nano ITX boards? And... Yep, so I played with the first, the chipset's called H57. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like P55. Uh, which is the Linfield chipset, okay. but what H57 does is it has a path from the CPU's graphics out to a, a DVI or HDMI port, Very nice. right, because the graphics are on the CPU now. Um, so same chipset, but a few less overclocking features, and, and you have that little path out to video. Um, one of the first Intel boards that they've got based on H57 is a mini ITX solution. Yay. Right? Because you're, you're at a two-chip solution now. Sure. You've got um, you know, your, your H57 chipset, and you, you've got the CPU. So their mini ITX board uh, actually has a full by 16 PCI Express slot on it, mm -hmm. um, two DDR3 DIMM slots, and four SATA ports. So it's, I mean, you could stick a 5870 in there and have a, a totally capable gaming machine. You're basically, so it's going to have more performance than, obviously, the, the Atom uh, yeah. NVIDIA ION combination, because you're just going to have so much more processor yeah. thrown at it. I mean, it's a lot more expensive, too. but. <laughs> it's a trade-off. Yeah. What else did you see that was exciting around IDF this year? Um, so, so Arendelle and Clarkdale were big. Um, a lot of the manufacturing announcements were interesting. Uh, so Intel showed off Sandy Bridge, which is next year's architecture. So it, it went uh, a Conroe, Penryn, Halem, Westmere, mm -hmm. which is what we're talking about now. And then Sandy Bridge is the next one. Uh, so Sandy Bridge takes your graphics that was on package, mm -hmm. but not on die, and merges it. So now you have a single chip that's your CPU and your graphics. Are pretty much all of those going to be baseline being able to do 1080p, yes. you know, MPEG-2, MPEG-4 decoding? Yeah. Okay. Well, so you take it out one or two more generations beyond that, and mm -hmm. then you ditch the crappy graphics core, and you bring in Larrabee. Right. And then it starts getting really, really interesting. Larrabee's actually going to do something someday. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, Larrabee was also at IDF. We saw right. the world's first Larrabee demo. Um, it wasn't an impressive demo, right. uh, because fundamentally the, the, the chip is, it's got a lot of bugs right, right. now. Um, just getting a chip to run is non-trivial. I mean, no. you, especially if you're doing a completely new architecture, you tape it out. I mean, it, you've seen the rooms at Nvidia where they like emulate everything in transistors. And yeah. Although I think they finally got to the point where they can no longer physically do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it's it's uh, not only is it new architecture, but it's I mean, it's a whole new direction for Intel. Sure. Um, but the thing is, at Intel, we're used to seeing the first rev of the silicon be up and running Windows and, and working perfectly fine. Right. So when they don't do that, then everyone's kind of like, oh, God. Um, but it's, it's not that big a deal. We still have a lot of time before Layer B1 comes out. So for intro to Layer B, is it just that it's such a radically different architecture, or is it just so much more complicated than what they've done? Or what, what's the kind of hitching point for Intel? There are a lot one? of things. It's new instruction set, mm -hmm. new architecture, huge chip. Right. right. So if you look at the, the class of GPUs that we have you know, right now, you're looking at two to three billion transistors. Yeah. Um, whereas you know, you're basically under a billion uh, for, for Nehalem class processors. It, it's amazing to realize just how insane it is, like the idea of a billion transistors. Yeah, on a the billion of anything is like ridiculous. Right. <laughs> that's, that's grains of sand on a lot of beach, actually. Yeah. And two to three in GPU. I mean, is Larrabee going to bring Intel up in step with AMD and NVIDIA? Or is it going to be something that's used in, in parallel with other GPUs? Use. Well, so I think the thing is that the, the initial, it's all about price, right? Mm -hmm. Larrabee 1, I don't think there's a chance that it would even remotely compete with the four, five, six hundred dollar GPUs. And I, I don't think Intel is aiming at that either. Uh, if you want my personal opinion, I think we'll see it in the, the sub two hundred dollar range. Um, and I think it, if Intel does their job properly, it might be performance competitive there. Mm -hmm. uh, it may use more power, it may have a lot of other issues, but uh, that, that, I think, is where you should set your expectations. Not, is, not overly high, but... This is almost like the Microsoft model, where it's not 1.0 or 2.0, but 3.0, but that's going to be the kick-ass version. I mean, I, I look at it like uh, Atom, honestly, mm -hmm. right? When Atom first launched, had the netbook not been there, Atom would have been uh, a total disappointment. Absolutely. Right? 
because it can't go into a smartphone, and no one wants to buy a freaking mid. Right. <laughs> so uh, I look, look at two. <laughs> <laughs> I look at Atom as you know the first generation was a nice architecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second generation gets a little more interesting because you can cram it into smaller devices. Right. But it's the third one where you can actually fit it into something the size of an iPhone. That would be nice. And then you start getting very, very exciting. Um, Plus, we could finally get to start waving the, the goodbye to the ARM architecture. Not that I don't love the ARM architecture, but well, so <laughs> you're looking at it from two different. There, there are two different things happening, right? So, uh, Atom has the performance, but the power consumption is is not on par with ARM. Right. So you see Atom dropping in power consumption, and at the same time, you see ARM increasing in performance. So the real question is, when do they cross? Right. And who's on top after they cross? <laughs> um, and, and it's, uh, you know, a Larrabee like, like Adam, it's mm -hmm. one of the situations where Intel's coming in as the underdog, um, which we're not used to. Because right. they walk into any environment, CPUs, even solid state storage, they walk in and they're like, they're king. They're king, especially solid state storage. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a couple of weeks. You've pretty much have written the definitive articles on, on SSDs. The issues, the excitement, the joy, the pain, the trauma, <laughs> actually also I think would be a good word for it. So can we talk a little bit more about SSDs in a couple of weeks? Yeah. Awesome. And then thank you so much for your time. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, if you have not been to the website, anantech.com, if you're into PC hardware, you should definitely go there and do some research, some reading, and find out really what's going on in terms of performance and technology with your new PC parts before you upgrade your machine. Trust me, it'll be worth your time. Let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, Squarespace. Squarespace is a publishing system for anyone looking to build a blog, portfolio, or any kind of website. They offer a uniquely flexible tool for just about anyone to build high-end, complex websites with the same functionality that you will find in some of the highest traffic pages on the web. No coding experience is required. Plus, Squarespace's newly launched Site and Porter tool makes things super easy to move over from your existing blogger website. They support WordPress, Blogger, TypePad, and movable type imports, and it migrates posts, comments, tags, authors, and media. And if you've been using custom domains, Squarespace will actually use the URL structure, ensuring that when you move your domain to Squarespace, in most cases, all your links will still work. So check it out now at squarespace.com and use the code TEKZ, that's TEKZ when you sign up to get 10% off the lifetime of your order. Please support Texilla by supporting our sponsors like Squarespace. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, dataliberation.org. Seems like Google has an arm reaching into every area of the web, and chances are you have some sort of data stored on Google's server somewhere. But would you know how to save your data back to your computer if you needed to? Enter dataliberation.org. Run by a team of Google engineers, dataliberation.org aims to help guide you through the process of getting your data back from the Google overlords and storing it safely on your own hard drive. Whether it's Gmail, Picasa, Blogger, YouTube, or even your web history, Data Liberation provides step-by-step -step instructions that guide you through the whole process. They also provide links to product-specific help pages, so in case you're still having trouble, you can find the answers you're looking for. So if you're planning on ditching Google services or just want to back up your data for safekeeping in case Google goes down, head on over to dataliberation.org to get started. I love my $500 PCs, but sometimes spending a bit more can get you big, fat performance benefits, as technology writer and analyst Lloyd Case is here to tell us. Welcome back to the show, Lloyd. Good to be here. IDF last week, what was, what was your favorite thing? Arendelle, you know, 32 nanometer, dual core processor for laptops, four threads. It's going to be, makes for some screaming fast, really thin laptops. And with like eight hours of battery That's right. off of a six cell battery, That's which right. is really Pretty exciting. Cool. You actually just finished benchmarking the snot out of the 5870 ATI's yeah, latest part. this guy. Uh, this big monster here. This is... 2.15 billion transistors. And okay, so this is obviously, I should say, this is, I am assuming this is obviously the fastest, greatest graphics card it ever is. at It is. It's faster than the fastest single GPU card by 30-40%. It's about as fast as a lot of dual, graph, dual GPU cards. What's going on with that? DisplayPort. DisplayPort is how this card can connect to three monitors. Oh, really? Because DisplayPort, the monitors can act as timing sources, so you don't have to worry about the internal timing available on the, uh, ch on the chipset itself. I thought we didn't like DisplayPort. Well, I'm, I'm kind of sold on it. The faster bandwidth, thinner cables, and external timing. Thinner cables would be nice. Uh, okay, what's the power consumption of this? When you're running full boards, 188 watts, you notice it only has two of the six-pin connectors, not eight and a six, so it's mm -hmm. not too bad. 
but at idle it's 27 watts. Really? So if you're running your normal desktop stuff, which most people do most of the time, even gamers, then it's just sitting there not barely more, more than a light bulb. Are small light bulb the, without. The usual five or six hundred dollar top of the heap pricing? 380. Really? Yep. That's actually almost in my range. Yep, it's pretty awesome. And they'll have a slightly downsized version 5850 for under 300. That's a really good deal. What kind of performance is the difference between the 5850 and the 5870? The 5850 should still be the fastest single GPU card you can get. I like that. Except thought. for this one, of course. <laughs> All of which are overkill compared. I was talking last week about uh, $500 PCs. You right. and I were bouncing some email back and forth. Mm -hmm. You pointed out one of the major flaws in the E3300. Yeah, today's uh, applications are really cache sensitive, much more so than even a few years ago. And so even adding more cache, on that dual core E3300, you got one meg of L2 cache, but that's shared between the two cores. So it sounds like a lot is one megabyte, but it's actually a pair of 512 Well, it's, it's shared, so they're con mm -hmm. constantly, the cores are constantly contending for that cache space. What about going up to the E6300, which is, no. I think, two megabytes yeah, of cache? Yeah, two megs, it's, it's considerably better. Uh, okay. And you'll see a lot better performance gain, and it's still pretty overclockable. And it's only 20 bucks, so right. <laughs> I like that thought. You have spec'd out a pretty impressive $800 gaming rig. Yeah, and that's $800 with the operating system. If you take a Core i5-750, mm -hmm. an Intel motherboard, that's a $99 P55 motherboard, Micro ATX, uh, an, an NVIDIA Core 216, that's a GeForce 260 GTX Core 16 graphics card, about 160. Not the 4870 from ATI? No, you can get the NVIDIA card for actually a little bit less money and it's oh, just really? about as fast, yeah. Cool. Yeah. NVIDIA's practically giving these things away. Wow. And then uh, four gigs of RAM. And then a standard DVD drive and a $50 hard drive, and you're there. And then the case is a Cooler Master case, the built-in 460-watt power supply. That's a really nice, that case you actually spec'd out, the Cooler mm -hmm. Master is really nice, and it's going to have actually have a high, for a case that has a hard, I'm so used to having cases with weak power right. supplies. Right. You know, it's a decent little power of. supply for this particular system. I wouldn't want to put two graphics cards in this, but other than that, it's fine. For a Core i5, it's right. not bad. So, we, is it time for Blu-ray, or any of the video games going to be coming out on Blu-ray anytime soon? No, no. They, only if you want to watch Blu-ray movies. And the nice thing is, the price of those Blu-ray ROM drives are down to under eighty dollars now. So oh, you wow! Can, you can get one of those if you want. And this will make this a seven hundred sixty dollars system if you want to do that. So basically, for the for the for for basically oh less than a third of what I paid for my Blu-ray HD DVD combo That's drive right. a few years ago, uh -huh. I could buy like seven of these. Today. Yeah, it burns DVDs. It won't burn Blu-ray <laughs> discs, but hey. So what's the next? If you want to go up to sort of an ultimate gaming machine at this point, how much more are you going to spend and what kind of performance boost are you going to see? Well, if you go to something like Core i7-950, I think, mm -hmm. uh, it's th over 3 gigahertz, triple channel memory, and then one of these badass graphics cards, you're probably talking a $1,400, $1,500 system. And the performance? Probably 40, 50% overall. So finally, you'll be able to play full frame Crisis with full anti-aliasing. Yeah. Actually, this <laughs> thing gets 30 frames a second. Really? Yeah, in Crisis at 19 by 12. I'm speechless. <laughs> I don't even know where to go with that. Lloyd, you have to come back and talk to us about, actually, I think our next project is going to be a, a home theater PC build-up. Yep. And uh, are you going to be building up the $800, the sub $800 gaming machine? I can do that for you. Bring it in. I will. Because I want to see you show us how to tune like the motherboard and the operating system for gaming. Sure. Lloyd, thanks so much, Matt. Good to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, coming up next, how to stop the party printer on campus and the top safety tip for running a generator. But first, GoDaddy.com, people. If you want to make an impact online, GoDaddy.com has what you need. Dot-com names are as little as $1.99, plus world-class hosting, fast and easy website builders, and much more. Your website visitors, prospects, and customers are wary of websites and online businesses that aren't what they claim to be and worried that their personal and financial information might fall into the wrong hands. Turn your visitors' paranoia into a competitive advantage with the ironclad protection of a GoDaddy.com secure certificate. Now, you want to score a discount? Enter in code TECH4, that's T-E-K-4, when you check out, and you'll save an additional 15% off any order of $75 or more. Some restrictions apply. See this eye for details. Please do us a favor here at TechZilla. Get your piece of the internet at GoDaddy.com and use one of those T-E-K codes when you do. Our first question comes from Davin up there in Chico, California. Davin writes, I recently discovered a huge annoyance in my college dorm. Since the network is one giant LAN, other people in the dorm have access to print to my network printer and are using up all my ink. USB cable would be an easy solution, but even with a hub, my MacBook is sparse on ports. Do you know of any way to password protect a network printer? He's running Snow Leopard. He wants our help. Davin, Chico, California. Davin will be attending the legendary party school of Northern California known as Chico State. It's north of Sacramento, and it is known for its festive, festive evenings. And quite frankly, I think lost printer ink, although it is rather expensive, as you've pointed well, out. Well, we're going to give it a reputation for that now. Yes. <laughs> well, it, no, it, it doesn't need our help. It's there. It's, yeah. it's, it's a party school. But it, 
I almost say, like, compared to some of the stupidity that went on in my college dorms, like, lost printer ink almost seems reasonable. I can accept that. Yeah, but he's already dealing with all that stuff. Oh. Yeah, this is just, yeah, this is just icing on the cake. Look, <laughs> he's got two, two solutions. Either lock that printer down mm -hmm. or get it off the network. Okay, so the easiest way to get it off the network, spend the 7 to 12 bucks to buy a USB hub, plug that into your computer, that'll give you your extra USB ports, then plug the printer into that and get it off the network, or get out the manual for your printer and figure out how to password protect it, since chances are there's some information on that inside the manual for your printer. Now, how else could he get it off the network? Well, if you've got a Mac or many kinds of computers, you've got two kinds of networks. You've got your hard mm. Ethernet and you've got your Wi-Fi. So if he's on the LAN and that's hard Ethernet, then just set up a Wi-Fi router in that actual room that mm -hmm. only services network devices in the room, like a network drive or this printer, and just use that at the same time. Put it on a different IP space and you'll be fine. Or vice versa. If you're on if you're on the college Wi-Fi network, then put it on a private uh, Ethernet network. That would be pretty painless. Now, if you want to be generous, let your roommate use that uh, printer when you're not around. You could also basically buy a cheap router, basically do MAC address translation, turn off NAT, turn off uh, the NAT network address translation inside your router, so you don't take out your entire dorm's internet access, and basically put your printer and your computers behind that router and that way you'll have a private address space and you can get to your stuff your roommate can get to your stuff anybody you choose to can get to your stuff but the rest of the general population will be locked out from you and your beloved printer ink so oh and by the way uh, csuchico.edu will probably help you out with setting up that router that's the services for the IT staff I believe I love the internet. You can find anything on a college campus. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we've got a couple of emails in response to the auxiliary power generator segment from last week. First one comes from Jeremy, who wrote, I like the segment the generator info, but I felt there was a crucial piece of info left out. Please, please, please do not use these units inside. It should be common sense, but I've heard too many news reports of bad things happening when people use these indoors. Thanks, Jeremy. Seth follows up with, you should have mentioned ventilation requirements, quiet or not, keep the generators outside. Seth, that is a very good piece of advice. I sometimes forget that the obvious isn't always as obvious as it should be. So let me state it one more time. Do not use a power generator indoors. Not even the little ones? Not even the little ones. Just a tiny one? The, you know what? Put it out a window, run the power cable in through the door. What about a solar power generator? That's a whole other, we'll talk about that last week. <laughs> <laughs> Those you can put on top of the house. But you got to point them as they move to the side. There is a new show, people, on Revision 3, Bite Jacker, hosted by Anthony Carboni. Bite Jacker covers the best in the world of independent and downloadable video games with in-depth reviews and analysis. Every week, Bite Jacker tells you what you should get from the Xbox Live Marketplace, WiiWare, iPhone, and tons more. New episodes every Thursday at revision3.com slash bitejacker. And for all of you watching, we love on your questions. So email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Check out product reviews, how to's, you ask us, we'll do it. But we need those emails, so don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Ryan Block. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Somewhere in Seattle, she's freaking out right now. Oh my God, somebody's doing his makeup. There she was. She'll feel a cold just... hand passing over me. <laughs> what? Are you a beginner for tech support for your friend? I, I can't read the prompter, dude. Yeah, actually, you were just doing it. <sighs> Go ahead and read it out. Never make good at this. There's, there's very little of this for you to do, so don't worry about All it. All right, I'll, I will do my best. Just read, just read through it's it. It's so fast. So comfortable with it. All right. Thanks so much, Anand. People, if you, if you want to, ah. That was an awesome facial expression, by the way. <laughs> In three, two, <laughs> that was really scary. If you've ever been to an Antec, ha. Ah. <laughs> I'm gonna try to slur seven words together into one long, miserable butchery.